Lesson one, understanding trout. To catch trout, you need to understand more about them, how they live, where they live, and what their world is like. The three things all trout seek, not in any particular order, are protection, comfort, and food. To a trout, deep water provides them with a form of protection. They rely on their speed to put them out of harm's way. They can go from zero to 25 miles an hour in a matter of seconds. Like logs or surface debris can provide protection, either floating on a lake or laying up against the shoreline. Even the overhanging branches of trees can provide cover for trout. Trout are cold blooded, their life is influenced by temperature and the location of oxygen in the lake. The location of oxygen is also influenced by temperature. Let me show you. Comfort is determined by structure. Between the fall and the spring, layers of the lake are determined by temperature. The warmest areas of the lake are on the bottom and the coldest areas are on the top. As fall goes into winter, then this cold area will increase. And what it'll do is actually build up a zone inside here. This is a place where the oxygen and the fish will love to stay. It, it's ideal for them. It's a mixture between the hot and the cold. And at that point, they can live. And they may adjust this up or down depending on the temperature above and how uh, this temperature may decrease. When the lake reaches 34.2 degrees. An unusual thing happens. The warm water actually goes to the top and the cold water goes to the bottom. It's called turnover. It takes 24 hours for this process to take place. They say if a lake has an outlet or an inlet that this process won't run. But I think if the inlet or outlet is not allowing a lot of water to move into the lake, then this process will occur. You can actually see it. If you go to the lake and get onto the water, you'll notice lots of uh, uh, inert material moving around and the visibility inside the lake is really kind of limited. This gives you an idea that turnover may have occurred. And what you want to do is just get off the lake and go home. Because when turnover does occur, everything in the lake is mixed like you taking a bowl of soup and mixing it with a spoon. That puts the of food inside the lake everywhere. So the fish aren't concentrated in a specific area, they're everywhere in the lake. So the opportunity to catch them becomes more difficult. So it's best to wait until that's occurred and then return a, the day, a day later and then begin your, or your fishing process. Food is the third. Large trout seem to prefer high calorie prey to size of prey based on availability. But when the frequency of large hatches are coming off with large numbers of insects available and easy to capture, the trout may choose to feed where this occurs. Research has shown that trout have a basic order of food that they prefer based on availability. Let's call it a still water menu. This is the basic order that they prefer, and this is an average order of insects year round. Later in the year, when all the insects are available, studies have shown that the trout have a preference to aquatic insects based on type and availability. We will study this season in our lesson number three. This order will actually change by temperature of the seasons, which influence availability. Let me give you an example. Zooplankton are microscopic organisms as part of an ecosystem of all lakes and make up the foundation for all trout food sources in lakes. Plankton comes in two sizes, those visible to the eye and those only visible through a microscope. Zooplankton is visible to the eye and is part of the plankton order in a lake. 
This is a throat sample from a trout. Look at the white object to the lower right of the screen as it moves left and up to the top. That is one of the shapes of zooplankton. You will also see different shapes when the sample contains more zooplankton. When you find zooplankton in a lake, they can give you very valuable information about where trout are feeding. You know, in the year-round uh, Stillwater menu, they're really ranked like number eight, but in the spring, they're closer to number one. Zooplankton actually live in schools. When the uh, weather is overcast, they move high in the water column to feed. When the weather is bright and sunny, they actually move lower to feed. When there is a wind moving across the water, they will be somewhere in between like this. They, like I said, they live in schools and the trout actually have established in the lake what they call a feeding zone. It's an area where there's good oxygen and they feel comfortable and safe. So they'll move through that zone looking for insects and, and bugs. If they find zooplankton, then they will actually consume it. They do consume it just like a whale consumes krill. They'll swallow it into their mouth They'll expel the water out of their gills, and they'll swallow, swallow the zooplankton. If you have a throat pump, you can actually uh, pull the zooplankton out of their stomach and uh, see them in, in water. This tells you where in the zone the fish are actually feeding. It, they'll move up and down based on the, the, uh, whether the, the lake is overcast or whether it's sunny. And if there's a... Uh, an area that's sheltered from the wind, they, per they really love that as well. So you should move in and try that as well. So one of the best indicators is in spring is the fact that zooplankton are there and they'll actually tell you where the trout will be when you start fishing. Now we'll cover more of this in detail in lesson number three. Two or three types of trout, brookies, browns, or rainbows. Each has a particular way of feeding. Brook trout stay, uh, stay deep, uh, preferring water 20 feet deep to, to hold in. They move up the water column from there to feed on insects. They listen for the sounds of prey moving. Then they move into position to see the prey, and then they move closer and smell the prey before they eat it. If the prey appears to be fleeing, they will move quickly to capture it. Brown trout are low light feeders that sleep during the day. They prefer early morning or late afternoon or early evening to feed. They are very particular about how they eat their food underwater. They use their ears and lateral line to detect food. They move toward it so they can use their sight when they get about two feet away. Then they use smell and touch in that order. They can actually move up to your fly and match the speed of it. What, then they smell it. If it smells okay, then they place their mouth over it and squeeze down gently. They do all this while you're presenting it, and you may not even know they're checking it to this degree. If anything about the fly is incorrect, they will reject it. Because of their actions, I actually test my new flies, which I've tied by going to a lake where brown trout live. If they reject any of my flies, I know that the materials, new materials that I've gotten or are using, have an odor to them they don't like. So I will retie my flies. Rainbow trout are daylight feeders and use sight as their main method of identifying and intercepting food. If water clarity is poor, then they rely on movement or smell to capture their prey. All trout have the same specific attributes. When they're over 14 inches, they become a predator. They seek out large live food by feeding on large hatches where prey is easy to capture. Their body is designed for hunting food underwater and 90% of what they eat lives there. Trout have an IQ of six. 
That means if they're six inches or 26 inches, they still have the same IQ. They have a memory of pain which lasts 48 hours. That means that if you hook them and they get off the hook, they won't bite any flies similar to the one that got them, gave them the pain. Lateral line is used for low frequency, that's pressure up to 20 feet, to detect size, direction, and speed. As some aquatic food moves through the water, the movement of displacing water can actually attract the trout. Their ears are internal in their skull and are used for high frequency and balance, noise from 20 to 30 feet away. Surface noise creates vibrations that trout can hear through their ears. And smell actually affects the trout in more ways than we can understand. Water, has a, a, a water from different lakes have different characteristics which can be identified by water quality. That would be their taste. The smell of water is translated very well and trout can rely on the smell when they cannot see their prey. Their prey. They can actually smell the difference between weed beds and they know which weed beds contain food. If the lake has an outlet for spawning, even though they're, they can't spawn, they actually can smell the difference in the water. In lesson five, I'll show you how to take advantage of each of these traits. As a trout moves through his world, he's influenced by taste and smell. As he takes water into his mouth to push through his gills, he'll actually taste it. And as he moves through it, he will actually smell it. There seems to be more particulates close to the shore than there is in deeper water. But still the influence of the taste and smell is there. I believe that each lake has a different taste and a different smell which influence the trout. Let's take a look at a water sample and see how it might impact the trout. Here are two samples from different lakes. The one on the right is the 15 acre lake in size and the one on the left 60 acre lake in size. You can see by the color that both are different. On the bottom of the jar you can see that it contains different particulates for and are unique to that lake. And as the water moves you can see it is similar to what we had seen when we looked at the taste and smell of lakes as particulates are moving around the fish. For all types of feeding, the eyes of a trout have a disadvantage. Their eye has a fixed iris. Feeding below the surface can be affected by the sun. More on that later. When it comes to feeding during pre-emergence or emergence or on the surface, their vision is subject to the snail's window effect. Basically, we look at snail's window two ways. Light above the surface of the lake, and light below the surface of the lake. Objects in these two realms are viewed differently. When light enters the water, it bends sharply. A fish in the water has a window view of approximately 97 degrees. That means all the light, which is 180 degrees at the surface of the lake, is compressed into the 97 degrees that the fish sees. At the edge of the window, where it is compressed more, objects in the window merge into the background. So if you stay under the 10 degree line, there's a chance you will not be detected by the fish. If you are wearing something shiny or something bright, the fish will see this as a blob of color and it will spook them. Now let's look at objects below the water. Snell's window. Snell's window is a phenomenon of light transmitted through water. Since fish have a fixed iris, when they look forward they can see food quite easily in the water. Up to 10 to 15 feet they can identify food as long as it's underwater. But when they look up they see a circle. That's Snell's window. The closer they are to the surface, the smaller the circle is. But further they are away, deeper, the larger the circle is. In the large circle, the center of it is actually very clear and it's sharp. 
they can identify size and shape and color quite easily. But on the edges, it's actually distorted, so it's a little difficult for them to identify the object except for the fact that they know it's there. So their vision is actually like a funnel, like this. This answers the question about when you're actually fishing for a brown trout and you see him laying in the water just below the surface and you take that fly and you put it right before his nose and he doesn't touch it. And you say, well, that's odd. What's the matter? Can't he see it? That's right. He can't see it. If it's here on the surface, his snail's window is above him, so he'll not be able to see it at all. Interesting phenomena, isn't it? Trout rely on this technique to see bugs, so to them it's actually a feeding technique. Now we'll uh, discuss this further and in more detail in lesson number four. So trout avoid sun when it first rises, unless they're in a position in the lake where their eyes can adjust as the sun rises. Let's take a closer look at this process. For example, when the sun first starts to appear and the fish happen to be in the shadows, they move quickly away and go into the shaded area of the lake or they will go deep. They'll continue to feed here with the, with the insects or prey that's in that region or over to here. They have to do this because if they get caught there where the sun is, it can affect their eyes so much that they cannot feed for at least two hours because they have a fixed iris. So to adjust their eyes to the new lumination position that's just hitting the lake, they will usually go into the shadows first and feed there. Slowly they'll work their way out into the sunlight as their eyes begin to adjust and eventually they'll be feeding in the entire lake because the sun will be high enough that there are no shadows to protect them.